All right. Hello. So it's 1201, so we'll get started. Welcome everybody to the Department of Psychiatry John Romano Clinical Rounds. I'm Dr. E.J. Santos. I'm the Clinical Chief for the Division of Geriatric Mental Health and Memory Care. And I am so pleased um, to present my friends and colleagues, uh, Dr. Carol Podgorski and Dr. Angela Kristen. So uh, a few reminders, right? Um, this is the clinical grand rounds. We will be talking uh, about a little bit about patients, but they're gonna be de-identified. Um, you should be hopefully learning something about, it actually says uh, without a family frame, but uh, I'm sure it'll be talking about with a family frame. Um, <laughs> Let's see. And at the end of this, I think you still get uh, an evaluation. Uh, if you're on Zoom, uh, please uh, put the questions uh, into the box, you know, there on the q and I will be going through them. Uh, and if we don't get to something uh, or you have questions afterwards that pop up that didn't come up on the Q&A, the three of us are always available. We're on Global. We're happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, and in our previous grand rounds, a lot of actual um changes in uh, clinical care and our protocols have uh, occurred because of things that happened in these grand rounds. So I really think it's important and I, I thank you all for being here. So without further ado, um, Dr. Carol Pogorski completed her doctoral degree in sociology and has a master's degree in public health and in marriage and family therapy. She is professor and associate chair of faculty affairs in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry. She is the director of the Finger Lakes Center of Excellence for Alzheimer's Disease and director of Alzheimer's Disease Support Programs for the University of Rochester Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program. She also serves on the advisory panel for outreach and education for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid and on the New York State Coordinating Council for Alzheimer's Disease and Related Dementia. Her academic interests include medical family therapy approaches to caregiving, and development of family systems oriented models of patient and family centered dementia care. And uh, it wasn't listed here, but um, my friend Carol is the reason that I am the medical director of our memory care program. She knows it, they tried to get me to do it for years and she's the clinic director and I'm the medical director. Everything we do is team-based and it really is centered on taking care of patients, their families, and caregivers, right? Um, so I, I'm excited for her to explain to you and for Dr. Kristen to show you what we do, even though sometimes people don't realize that we do everything with a family frame. When we're always talking about patient-centered care and somebody has dementia, right? So hopefully this will open your eyes to other ways that we can um, you know, approach our patients uh, even if they don't have dementia, in a family-centered way. And I think we'll learn all learn a lot from this. Thank you. And thank you, EJ, for that introduction and for giving Angela and I the opportunity to present here today. So it is certainly my pleasure to be here and um, to share some of the important work that we do at 315 Science Parkway. Okay. Okay, so we have no financial um, disclosures to report. And without further ado, I'm just going to jump right in here. So I'd like to just start before we uh, start diving into dementia, just with a brief description of what dementia is for those of you who don't work at this at this end of the of the um, life cycle. Um, so dementia, according to DSM-5, we usually focus on two categories, mild neurocognitive disorders and major neurocognitive disorders. And a mild cog neurocognitive disorder is typically mild cognitive impairment. And what that means is that it requires evidence of at least some kind of a slight decline from a previous level of function in at least one of the cognitive domains. And they are listed in the bottom there. Attention, executive function, learning, memory, language, perceptual motor, and social cognition. And for a mild neurocognitive disorder, uh, the patient needs to have impairment that does not interfere with independent um, ability to carry out those activities, even though it might require more attention. 
In order to meet criteria for a major neurocognitive disorder, this requires evidence of significant decline from a previous level of function, and the impairment is sufficient enough to interfere with independence in everyday activities. So Alzheimer's is the most common cause of dementia, accounting for 60 to 80%, depending on whose estimates you use. Other types of dementia that commonly pop up are, are vascular dementia, frontotemporal dementia, and Lewy body dementia. And in the United States, there's an estimated 6.7 million Americans who are living with Alzheimer's or another type of dementia. And then if we project that at the level of the world, there are 55 million people living around the world and, it, and dementia is the seventh leading cause of death. What's important is if our healthcare um, standards and everything th that we do right now stays on course, these numbers are predicted to increase to 9 million by 2030 and to 12 million by 2040. And the system already is at a breaking point with being able to care for these people. Um, I also wanted to take a look at prevalence by race and ethnicity. And you'll notice on the bottom that um, clinical AD as well as mild cognitive impairment is lowest for non-Hispanic white populations and increases for Hispanic and increases even greater for black populations. So a lot of times people don't seek care for memory loss because they assume that dementia is memory loss, that memory loss is just a part of what happens when you get older. And um, they associate, associate age-associated memory impairment with dementia. They're very, very different things. So memory loss is just one component. And the other things that um, characterize dementia are impairment in verbal skills, in visual spatial perception, which is why driving becomes an issue. In abstract thinking, right? How is a banana and an apple the same thing, right? People's ability to do that. Orientation to person, place, time. Attention span. People with Alzheimer's disease typically have a very short attention span and it gets shorter over time personality changes. And we have seen personality changes where people have gone from being very challenging human beings to being very docile. And, but more often the opposite of when people are, have gone from being very docile to being combative and um, showing different sides of their personality. Their reasoning and judgment often gets affected and people lose the ability to do things like take care of the checkbook, um, and, and do other kinds of things like that. And then eventually it affects bladder control, bowel control, and motor function. And then eventually, if people live long enough, they will die from organ failure with dementia as a root cause. And it wasn't until really about less than two decades ago that dementia was allowed to be listed as a cause of death. And um, now, because of that, it's ranked as about the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. So each of these little characters is about a million people. So if we have between six and seven million people, we also have 17 million family caregivers who are taking care of them. And those 17 million caregivers provide 18 plus billion hours of care. And that is equated to be $340 billion worth of care provided by family members and other unpaid caregivers. They are really the backbone of the long-term care system for dementia. The costs of caregiving are very high. I'm not gonna go into each one of these in too much depth, but there is a literature supporting the cost of caregiving for each of the bubbles on this diagram. For example, for physical health, dementia caregivers often have worse immune function. Um, they are also um, more likely to not take care of themselves. So they're more likely to have hypertension, diabetes, and things like that. In terms of mental health, they're more often likely to have depression and anxiety. 
And they also have more caregiver burden than people who care for people with other types of chronic conditions. Economically, caregivers usually take a great economic loss. The prototypical family caregiver is a 46 year old woman, usually sandwiched in the sandwich generation. Um, they often take an economic loss because they often have to leave the workforce or decline promotions because they don't have the flexibility to take on more responsibilities. Um, there have been estimates from Metropolitan Life that said that they end up with about $210,000 less than people who are not caregivers in terms of retirement and savings. They also, there are costs of caregivings in terms of family. When you think that a course of dementia lasts an average of 10 years, you think about all the family events and all the kinds of things that people miss out on because of being tethered to being a caregiver. People also struggle from social, social isolation. Um, an ironic thing is that during the pandemic when everyone was socially isolated, dementia caregivers felt a little better. Not that other people were suffering, but because they weren't missing out on something. So it was a very normalizing thing. Um, many times caregivers often lose themselves. Um, they lost who they were as a professional um, and the tasks of caregiving become so great that a lot of the activities and things they participated in, <clears throat> they can no longer do. And there are also studies that show that dementia caregivers sometimes die sooner than caregivers of, of other illnesses. So are we really doing our best to value and support family caregivers as the backbone of our healthcare system? <clears throat> In 2018, the um, Administration for Community Living, a DHHS organization, established a commission called the RAISE Family Commission, Caregiving Commission. And RAISE stands for Recognize, Assist, Include, Support, and Engage for Family Caregiving. And they have released a couple of reports, the most recent in 2022. And that report contained 300 action items that the states and federal governments could do to do a better job of taking care of family caregivers. We're just at the beginning of implementation of any of that. So the bottom line is that supporting family caregivers is a public health priority. It's been recognized and slow to implement but we all recognize that without taking care of these people, it will really bankrupt our Medicare and Medicaid systems. So let's look at patient and family-centered care. And the question I pose is, is it enough in dementia care? So the Institute of Medicine I, uh, described patient-centered care back in 2001. And they said it's being respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values. And it's about honoring patient and family choices, including them in, in decision-making, sharing accurate information with patients and families as it becomes available, and collaborating across healthcare settings. Family-centered care, there are a lot of definitions, but for purposes of this presentation, we're just gonna go with developing and implementing patient care plans with family participation. So now let's look at the current treatment strategies for dementia. And these I pulled out of um, several years ago, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid came up with a code that um, physicians could use to do comprehensive care for treating dementia. These are pulled out of that. So what, what providers are expected to do in order to reach the um, threshold for that billing code is to provide an accurate diagnosis, to do their best to manage risk factors that could be managed, like hypertension, for example, to prescribe medications to manage the symptoms, Referring to clinical trials is a really big thing now. And sometimes uh, when I started in this field in the early 80s, um, people were reluctant to join clinical trials. Now people are very disappointed if they're not accepted in clinical trials because the best state of the art care 
and access to things like PET scans and those things are more widely available through clinical trials. So now people are really disappointed if they can't do that. And sometimes it's it's often the best care available. Um, another thing is to encourage the person with cognitive impairment and family to do planning for the future, providing education for the family caregiver about what dementia is, how to manage behaviors, what to expect, um, to refer the patient and family for support and community service, and then wait and wa watchful waiting. And then there's also about discussions of providing end of life care. So the Alzheimer's Association also has care plan objectives, which are very similar to these, but these are a lot of times for the, for the caregiver, um, like providing um, the person with cognitive impairment with meaning and purposeful activities, um, helping to maintain a sense of self-identity and relationships with others. That's another expectation we have uh -huh. of caregivers. Uh, providing opportunities for caregivers to connect with other people living with dementia and other caregivers through support groups. Um, education, of course, is a theme and future care planning. So these are the different roles that we ask family caregivers to assume, and there's quite a few of them. So what's missing? Well, first, the acknowledgement of the family caregivers' biopsychosocial needs. Did you see anything about that in any of those slides? We're relying on them, but everything was very patient-centered. And the other thing that's missing is an assessment of how family relationships, behaviors, health, and family resources may affect the person with dementia's health and well-being. So if we look at this um, socio-ecological model for patients and families, the first one being of the patient and the bottom one being of a family caregiver, you'll notice that all the things I talked about are only focused on patient-centered care at the individual level, not at the level of re even relationship, right? So assessment and treatment strategies focus only on the needs of the patient in this level and not within the context of the person's relationships or their environment. So when I think about family caregivers, and after having been a family therapist working with them for many, many years, they're the first, first and foremost, they think about being family to the person in need of care. And our healthcare system calls on them and expects them to become part of the healthcare team right? We expect them to, when Dr. Santos and Dr. Kristen come up with a plan of care, they're the ones who have to really implement a lot of that. So we draw them in, but we often do that without knowing if they're able and willing to do it, if they have the resources, whether it's financial, whether it's health literacy, whether it's any number of resources, time to be able to perform the tasks that are required. We often don't know what other types of responsibilities they have. Um, they might have um, a, a, an ill child. They might have work responsibilities. There might be other things competing for their time and resources. And here's one of my favorites. We also don't know if the caregiver of record or the one who comes to the appointment is the one that the person with cognitive impairment prefers to be in these roles. We often put the person who comes to the appointment listed as the caregiver when it often might be the daughter who has Tuesday afternoon available, but the person with healthcare proxy and power of attorney might be the son who lives in Chicago, right? So sometimes we don't do, we just assume that the person there is the person. It might not be the best person to communicate. It might not be the person who has authority in the family to do this. So we don't ask sometimes. So in my idea of things, we need to do a better job of looking at the person in terms of their relationships and community and also the family caregiver in terms of their relationships and community. 
So the family matters. So what do we as healthcare providers need to know? So we need to know why caregivers provide care. And there are basically three reasons. The first is attachment because they love, they love the person with dementia. The other one is obligation, whether it's because of family of origin considerations or cultural considerations, there's a sense that I owe this person something. And the last one is exchange. I feel like if I do this, I'll get something back. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in a bad way. It could be karma. You know, there's just a sense if I do this, something good might come my way. So the other thing we need to know is that becoming a caregiver isn't, doesn't just mean that the person who showed up and walked in the door has signed on the dotted line to be a caregiver. Um, it usually involves a decision and it usually involves a lot of thoughts and feelings. So spouses often don't like the label caregiver because they believe that their wedding vows said, I'm in this for the long haul. And they don't often attend caregiver programs because that label doesn't often fit for them. Some spouses and children put a boundary on what they are willing to do. They're, they like dip their toe in and afraid if they you know, get too much, then they'll never be able to get out of it. And some family members are doing this because they make promises that they might not be able to keep. The one most often is having strangers come into the home or going into a long-term care facility. So we also need to know that context matters. So there are some of the ones that I've heard. My mother left when we were young. Now she expects me to take care of her. Okay, might, might be a toe dipper, right? <laughs> Not necessarily all in. I would like to know if my husband's dementia was caused by his years of alcohol abuse. If it wasn't, I won't have a problem caring for him. But if it was, okay. My wife took care of me and our kids for many years while I was working. Now it's my turn to take care of her. Often hear about this from from men, especially men from the quote unquote greatest generation. And they really don't want to ask for help because they feel so strongly that this is their time to give back. My husband had an affair for the past 20 years of our marriage, and now I'm expected to give up my life to take care of him. Context matters. The other thing is, you know, you, you heard the expression a rose by another, by, a rose by any other name or a rose is a rose is a rose. Well, family caregivers and relationships are like that too. We can't put them all in one bucket. Caregivers should not be viewed as a single group. Sometimes there are not a lot of family relationships available and the kinship people are not related by blood. Sometimes families are have very um, extensive extended family uh, relationships, and there are a lot of people to draw from. When there has been a divorce or widowhood, that's another very complicated situation, especially if there are assets involved and who's in charge of the care. Is it the daughter? Is it the new wife, the second wife? There are, it's very, very sticky when there are divorce and widowhood issues. Second marriages are tricky. And when people live alone, it's also more complicated. So there are not a lot of cultural examples of cultural considerations, but believe me, they are really there. Um, when I was doing a search, I was looking at family relationships and dementia and caregiving. And there's really, well, there's very little in family relationships at all but I found a couple of examples. And one of them was that in, an Afri in a group of African-American family givers, caregivers, they reported that they provide care to give back to family members and for religious reasons, which is a number one reason of why, why they are willing to, to go all in. And in Latinos, there was a focus group and they said that they thought it was really important to provide education psychoeducation, problem solving, and communication skills to multiple family members. So they wouldn't like the model of just one person coming to the clinic. They would like to bring the whole family in so that everybody can hear the information and they can do more of a division of labor. Um, and they also ask for more assistance um, to manage family tensions. 
So the other thing we know from the literature is that caregiver strain and burden are related to poor family function, poor problem solving, communication, and poor role function. We also know that when there's high relationship satisfaction, that there's usually less reactivity, less caregiver burden, and better problem solving. And the other one is caregiver authority. I mentioned that sometimes the person who comes to the clinic isn't the one who has any authority, but sometimes no one in the family has any authority. So we have the caregivers doing that whole slide that I have of all those tasks they could do. Often they're doing them without authority, but they have a lot of responsibility. So only about half of Americans have had end of life conversations with family and only 27% have completed advanced care planning documents. Family dynamics are related to whether or not those end of life discussions occur. So when families function better, when there's marital satisfaction, when they feel good spousal support or close relationships with their adult children, they're more likely to complete advanced care planning documents. Most older adults prefer an independent leadership role in advanced care planning, but they wanna do it with their physicians and they also want family and close friends to be part of those conversations. So family relationships matter also. There's actually quite a good literature on family favoritism and sometimes families, um, the person who has always been the favorite, other children resent and they say, well, she's always been the favorite, she can do it. But on the other hand, sometimes the person who has not been the family favorite sees this as their last opportunity to get mom or dad's approval. So they go in all in to try to do that. Um, the other thing we have to be aware of is elder abuse and dementia. So there have been some studies that have looked at um, elder abuse and dementia. And we see big, big range of estimates from 28 to 62% of psychological abuse, physical abuse, three to 23%, neglect, financial exploitation, and multiple forms of abuse at 31%. Family caregivers also report that they have been on the receiving end of verbal abuse by the patient and 6% reported physical abuse. So you see those are small numbers, but 6% of 18 million is 6.3 million people who have experienced physical abuse. So it's really not small. So family relationships can create power dynamics that lead to the caregiver misrepresenting the patient's wishes they can lead to elder mistreatment, to mistreatment and also to family violence. So consider this, in a clinic population of a thousand patients with cognitive impairment, if we apply Dong's conservative estimate of elder abuse at 31%, it's likely that 310 people in that practice are victims of abuse. And my question is, how many practitioners would be able to identify who those 310 older adults in their care might be. So I say we need to look inside the house and look for a family frame. This is a model of care um, that I published a couple of years ago with two colleagues of mine from the University of Alberta in Canada. And they are two women who created an amazing national model for caregiver-centered care. And it's really phenomenal. But what it says is we need to look at the patient in the context of their relationships and the caregiver in the context of their relationships. We also need to look at the relationships between them. So the theoretical underpinnings of this is family systems theory, which says all parts of a family are related. You can't understand one part if you only know, you can't understand the whole thing if you only understand one person. Um, family functioning can't be understood by understanding one member and how a family is structured, how they relate to one another, um, influence behaviors of its members. And the other part of this is that family members have distinct ecological systems. Even if they live in the same household, they still have different systems. And the goal of family-framed care would be for medical health and human service providers 
to know and understand what the patient and the family needs in the context of their relationships. And I contend that we need to do that in order to meet the biopsychosocial needs and wishes of the patient, as well as those of the caregiver. And I also think if we don't do that, we will create care plans that are not feasible, not likely to be implemented, and care plans that will not promote the safety and well being of the patient or the caregiver. Um, I'm going to wrap up in a minute to give Dr. Kristen time. Um, but some of the things I've noticed is we often, too often, assume close trusting relationships, right? We assume that when a caregiver comes in, that they love each other. Might be true, might not be true. Most of the time it is. I don't want to be, you know, really negative about this, but we can assume that they always are. Um, Sometimes when we get referrals, we'll notice that when we look at the family and social history, what we get is smoking status. Family history is a lot more complicated than smoking status, and we really need, need to do a better job of that. Um, then I'm going to jump to the bottom one and just to, again, reiterate that we have to stop assuming that the informant is the caregiver or the healthcare proxy or the person who actually has authority. So patient-centered care with a family frame gives us a chance to, um, I know that it's, it's difficult to think, we see people who come in for their first appointment, sometimes when they first discover that they have a memory loss or sometimes when they've had fluid dementia for many years. But fortunately, because of all of the public awareness, we're seeing a lot more mild cognitive impairment. So we can have a lot more of these conversations that we couldn't have before. So can the patient provide accurate information? Can we ask them about how they think their health and memory is? And how do they feel about being there? What are their hopes and fears? This is an important one. Is the patient comfortable with the person accompanying them answering questions about their health, memory, and function? It's kind of like informed consent. And we've all seen reasons of why it's really important to know that. And then it's good to know if they have a healthcare proxy. Same for the caregiver informant. What is their relationship? Do they have authority? Um, does the person, does the accompanying person regard themselves as a caregiver? Who else is involved? How would the patient feel about them answering questions about health, memory, and function? Which means, do they have insight about the relationship? Whose idea was it to schedule this appointment? No, it's hard to believe, but we often have many families who bring people in who don't tell them why they're coming or where they're going. Um, and what do they expect from the appointment? So I'm gonna just skip through this and say, so what are prospects for family-framed care? Well, right now, often pretty dismal, right? We know that relational dynamics are an unrecognized social determinant of health for the family and for the person with dementia. We also know it's not possible to provide patient-centered biopsychosocially oriented care without knowing about family relationships. But it's not reimbursable because we only have one patient of record. It's time consuming. And it's an issue that if something is identified, it must be addressed. So if you don't ask it, you don't have to do anything about it. And often providers don't like working with conflictual families. So there's an uphill climb there. So just a background to our clinical setting. So these are our medical providers at the Memory Care Program, which is the clinical hub and centerpiece for the Finger Lakes Center of Excellence for Alzheimer's Disease, which is a $2.3 million grant that we got from the New York State Department of Health. We are one of 10 centers across the state recognized as experts in diagnosis and care of people with dementia. And we serve nine counties and we collaborate closely with the uh, Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program for professional education and for lifespan for community outreach throughout the regions. We have a multidisciplinary team model that provides consultation, assessment, treatment, and ongoing supportive care. And we're talking usually for 10 years to patients and families. And I mentioned the CIAD because 
We're lucky to have it because it supports clinical services that are not generally reimbursable. So you'll see myself um, had not typically had not been uh, reimbursable prior to Medicare, just being able to um, be something accessible for marriage and family therapists. It also support, supports a large portion of our social work team and some of our nursing team and some administrative support. So let's shift to family framed care and practice. And I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, Dr. Angela Mopin Kristen. And let me tell you about Angela. Angela is from Oklahoma and she trained at the University of Oklahoma where she received her medical degree. And then she came to the U of R Department of Family Medicine to complete her residency, which she did at Highland Family Medicine. And after that, she trained in the Geriatric Medicine Fellowship Program and then EJ didn't miss a beat by scarfing her up in 2018 and saying, we think you would be a really good fit for the memory care clinic. So she has been with us since that time. Um, the other thing is that she also has a master's degree from the, let me get it right, Institute for Studies on Marriage and Family at Catholic University in Washington, D.C. And she also has had experience as a family caregiver. And when we were pre preparing for this, I was so happy that I invited Angela to join me today. Thank you. It's it's lovely to, to be with you today. I owe my position at Memory Care. You said to EJ, but it was actually you, Carol, that um, after spending, during my fellowship year, we would meet monthly with Carol. And she had mentioned maybe after six or seven months, I think this might be a really good fit for you. And memory care was not on my radar at all, but indeed it has been a really good fit. So uh, I'll, what I'll do today is just introduce you to um, how I prepare for patient sessions. Um, what kinds of things I'm looking for as I'm preparing to meet the patient and meet the caregivers. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's certainly not a perfect model. It's something that I've developed over the past five years and is still in development. Um, hopefully I'm, I'm continually perfecting it. Um, so, and certainly I'm, I'm open to, uh, to comment. So if you have any thoughts about it, I, I hope you'll raise your hand and, and share your, your, uh, your thoughts. So uh, in preparation, I have a few tools for investigation and, and probably the most important tool that I have, and I tell this to, to patients and caregivers daily that uh, our social workers are hands down the greatest asset that we have in, our, in our, our memory care program. They are fantastic. So before I actually see the patient, the, the social worker has, has done a, an assessment and I know from reading that assessment um, I know if they are, if the patient is capable of completing independently their a, uh, ADLs, their more complex IA ADLs. Um, I know uh, if they live alone, or I, I know if they if they're if they're married, if they're single. I know their level of education. Um, I know if there are any harms at home. Um, I know if there's been a, a history of suicidal ideation, um, depression, or anxiety. And typically the, the social workers, they prepare a summary paragraph. And with after I've read that summary paragraph, especially if it's done with a caregiver, I can make the diagnosis and the diagnosis being either, let's say, dementia or not dementia. Um, and But most of the time I can make the diagnosis before I see the patient. Um, if the if the assessment's been done with um, with the patient alone, because it's a memory care program, I have to have a high index of suspicion that okay, this may be accurate, it may not be. So before I go into the room, I kind of have to know that and make sure that I'm asking the right questions. If it's done with the caregiver, um, there's still things that that need to be teased apart, and I'll I'll, I'll work through some of that with you. Um, I look at the referring physician documentation. Why is the patient coming? Why have they been referred to memory care? Has a family member called the primary care office um, and, and complained about uh, their, their loved one's memory? 
um, is has the patient themselves voiced concerns or is it just something that the primary care physician picked up on and so they feel like that they, they could utilize our services. I do think memory care is a great asset. We are a tool for the primary care physician. I mean, I'm, I'm trained in family medicine. Um, you know, I have the tincture of time with the patient. I have an hour for every new patient assessment and 30 minutes for every follow-up. And I've got these three, actually four amazing social workers that are doing all this, this legwork for, for myself and really ultimately for the patient, for the family. So um, we can send, um, in our assessment, we're sending a lot of information back to the primary care physician that even though they might've seen this patient for a, a year, two year, 10 years, I feel like a lot of times we we really enlighten them on what's happening with the, with the patient, what's happening in the home, things that they might not normally glean from, say, a 20 or 30 minute annual visit. Um, the guiding questions are, um, again, what initiated the patient's referral? Who initiated the referral? And then is the patient, the, the, the seminal question is, is the patient safe? Okay. So again, prior to and during the visit, um, I'm asking, is the caregiver, I'm focusing not just on the patient, but the caregiver as well, is the caregiver caregiver able to meet the identified needs of the patient? So diagnosis is one thing. Um, does the patient have minor neurocognitive disorder, major neurocognitive disorder? Um, if it's major, if, if it is dementia, um, okay, I've identified that, now, now what? what's happening with the person that's next to them if they're accompanied. Um, if they're not accompanied, now that's a whole different, that, that poses a whole new issue. Now the, now the team has to really work on building a team for them. Um, I mentioned this in a, in a future slide, but patients don't, our patients do not like coming to the memory care program, the vast majority of them. The, that name just doesn't feel, it's almost like Welcome to the dementia the dementia center. Who who wants an appointment at the dementia center? So what I tell them is, you know, if I could change the name of our clinic, I would. I'd probably name it to the Center for Graceful Aging. And as soon as I say that, I, and I'm really all of my patients, you can see their you can see the tension leave leave their faces. They relax. Some even smile, or they even say verbally, "I like that." Because who doesn't want to age gracefully? And the key, the, the, next, the next line is the key to aging gracefully is teamwork. And if you have family, if you have friends, then that's, that's a bonus. Then we have your team and now I'm a part of your team and our, the memory care program's a part of your team. And we're here to support you, to help you navigate what's ahead. And what the goal is graceful aging. Um, what is, what's a threat? Well, not having a team, being by yourself, that means we need to build one for you. Uh, we need to look at the at community resources and start find out who lives next door. Um, find out if you have if, if are there any living relatives. Um, so those are the those are the things that social work um, can help me with. Um, and then also too, just um, you know, I need to know is that caregiver if they are there, is there any fatigue? Is there burnout, depression, anxiety? So typically when I do suspect that, I'll ask the caregiver, do you have a primary care doctor? If it's a couple, um, generally the, they share a primary care physician and that's super helpful. If it's someone within our system, this is quick. All I have to do, I, this, is, this is one of the benefits of, of the EMR. Um, I can send a quick message during the visit to the primary care doctor and say, this caregiver, I don't know if you realize this or not, but they're really struggling. Um, maybe if I have time, I can do a PHQ-9 or a G87 and send that along with them. But I'd let the, the, the PCP know this person needs to be seen and they probably need some medication or they need a referral to older adults. Um, and then uh, and pr the primary care physician, physicians are really happy to receive that information. I've gotten nothing but positive feedback from, from, the, from the community, from our community physicians. And it really, if you get in the habit of doing it, it really doesn't take that, that much time. It's just a matter of going into in-basket, sending a message, or, um, or sending using the, the instant message function on, on the, the e-record. Um, and then I, I encourage the caregiver themselves to reach out to their primary care doctor, um, especially if they're outside the system. In, in uh, cases where I'm really concerned, 
I'll I'll pick up the phone at the end of at the end of a session and I'll I'll make a phone call to the clinic to their clinic nurse or, or ask to speak to the physician uh, themselves. Not always, but there have been some circumstances where that's been warranted. Now, um, is the patient safe? So prodromal or mild neurocognitive disorder, really what I'm looking at when I'm making a diagnosis is, um, is are they able to manage more complex IADLs without oversight or assistance? Um, Meet that MCI category to 15% annual risk of progressing toward the and progressing toward and crossing the threshold of dementia. Okay. So if they do have MCI, where do I think that they are on that continuum? Are they closer to the threshold? You know, are they further away? Um, and that that does make a difference. Um, if caregiver physically, emotionally, are they financially capable of providing support to the patient? And then, um, you know, what, what are the barriers and how can I address those barriers? Fortunately, I have a team. Um, I have, I can, can refer them to see Carol if they need behavioral health support, um, or if they just need help with acceptance of a diagnosis um, oftentimes I think of spouses who are, um, who are just wrecked because they're emotionally wrecked because they're losing their loved one. They, um, maybe they've had a family member that they've watched decline. When they think of dementia, they don't think of mild or moderate stages of disease or severities. They think they're in a panic. So, so Carol is a great asset, or I can refer them across the, the waiting area to older adult services and get them connected, connected with behavioral help there. Um, some patients, um, sometimes it's just uh, asking for social work to meet with the, the families after the topics. Um, and then also, also support groups, like uh, getting them, getting the family in touch with the Alzheimer's Association, getting them in touch with Lifespan. So in terms of, of, of really assessing the caregiver, I can glean a lot just by body language, watching their body language, then their tone. Um, do they insist upon speaking privately without the, the person with dementia? And if so, why? Um, some, of the, um, some of the reasons that I've, that I've encountered are that maybe they have appropriate sensitivity to the person with dementia. They realize that this is hard for them. There's some things that they they want to say that they don't feel comfortable saying in front of them, um, or they need to say some things and they need help crafting those that that those words. Uh, and so we can we can rehearse in a sense uh, how that. Or I can, sometimes I'm just bad cop. <laughs> you tell me what you need them to know, and I'll deliver the message. And that usually comes up with driving. Um, are they secretive? Um, with You know, I, I see probably 1,200 patients. A lot of you, you can variations in tone and body language, and even just general dispositions uh, in the the family dynamic. Um, does the person with dementia have minimal insight into their deficits? And that that person with dementia is typically very defensive and even hostile. So the caregiver may want to meet because they're afraid of um, of retaliation. Uh, so that's a that's a concern. Safety concerns are, are there safety concerns or, uh, or is there substance abuse? And do they need to disclose that? And it may be I may be the first person that they've disclosed to. And so again, I need social work to help me put together support resources. And really important uh, is does the conversation um, does their language reflect an understanding of dementia as a disease? Um, or I'll give a couple of examples of this later. Or does it, uh, are they blaming the person with dementia? Um, is there just a, are they just needing, are they needing education and support? So again, um, is the relationship between the patient and the caregiver 
or is, am I seeing a loving uh, and supportive relationship versus, um, or am I picking up on some hostility? Is there open interpersonal communication? Um, is there psychological flexibility? Can they adapt to this change in their relationship? Um, and and are they are they in denial? You know, is that are they still trying to think that this is just normal? Um, this is normal aging, and so they're dismissive of the real changes that are taking place. So here's that that statement: the key to aging with grace is teamwork and interdependence. So I really try to impress this upon all of my patients and the caregivers. And I think probably all of us need to hear this. You know, independence is overrated. Interdependence is much more valuable. And it it really is the key to, to graceful aging and to graceful, you know, collegial relationships and professional relationships. Like we, we need each other. None of us needs to be on top. We really have to lay the ladder down and work together with the goal of loving and serving the person that's before us. So um, if, if, is teamwork possible? Are there barriers? And um, is there an attachment to independence? The, what are the relationship dynamics and history? What are the specific, what's the specific history? Um, in more than a few uh, patients, there's been a history of infidelity. And for some reason, uh, during, in the dementia, the disease process, even if someone maybe was at peace with the infidelity, maybe there's a reconciliation in the relationship, that seems to come back with a vengeance um, with the dementia diagnosis. Um, finances, are there financial constraints? That's just the practical aspect. Uh, we've, you know, sometimes we have to, if there's financial exploitation, we need to get them to lifespan because they have a department that focuses on financial exploitation. And then is there physical, mental, emotional health or a lack of? Does the, does, is the, is the caregiver really, is their anxiety so severe that this just isn't possible and we need to think about some alternative options? And I, again, another important um, important piece that I try to introduce um, more from a you know behavioral health perspective, I try to teach all of the patients that just the tool of reframing. How do we uh, reframe this diagnosis from a from threat to challenge? And um, that takes a few visits, but um, but but it can be very rewarding. Um, professionally rewarding for, for sure, um, but re very rewarding for, for the caregiver. It gives them meaning. It helps them to uh, accept, you know, they, we've got to live life on life's terms, accept where they are and what's happening, and then figure out a, a strategy for moving forward. So instead of, of, of walking through specific cases, what I've done thinking through this, this process, I, I thought about categories that I typically see, and I tried to, to uh, think of the more challenging cases. So um, case one, uh, this, this particular category would be caregiver denial. So um, in one particular case with Lewy body dementia, I had a husband who insisted on the first visit that she didn't have any cognitive decline. She was just distracted. She'd always been kind of flighty. You know, she, she plays music in the car and she dances and she sings and she doesn't pay attention to what she's doing. When she's making dinner, she's drinking a glass of wine and dancing and she's not paying attention. So she, she uses vinegar instead of oil in the recipe. I mean, so <laughs> these were his, his he, you know, there's nothing wrong with her. She just needs to get it together. Together. Um, and then over time, after about two years, and as we've progressed into more dramatic symptoms, um, especially her calling 911 because she was seeing, she keeps seeing people in the backyard, um, it became obvious that we needed to get more family members involved, and social work was really helpful in that. So now sisters and a, a daughter are helping. Um, one one of the daughter, but one daughter lives out of state, but she comes every um, six to six to eight weeks and spends a week with her mom, and she's willing to do this for now. We we have two questions. Oh, to okay, to okay. Do you want me to take this now or? Okay, let's do that now. I think, I think this uh, first question is in, interesting in this terms. Too. Can you talk a little more about resistance? denial on the part of the uh, person with cognitive impairment and how would you would approach that? So instead of the caregiver having denial, the, the patient. Okay. Well, my strategy is just um, kind of accepting where they are. Um, on a positive note, um, if, if they have limited insight into their deficits, sometimes that's okay because 
they're less prone to depression. They're not coming into the office in a pile of tears and paralyzed by, by fear because they don't know what's about to happen. That's an advantage. And I try to point that out to the caregiver. The, the, uh, the concern though, is that because they have limited insight, um, they, they may be making unsafe decisions. So that's where we have to, um, to talk about, and usually I'll just say, is it possible, you know, if your family member is seeing these things, is it possible that, that they that this, this is really happening and just try and negotiate that. Um, I wanted to just add one thing to that. And that is that, um, it's, it's kind of like motivational interviewing and you listen for change language. So if a patient says, if they won't admit they have a memory problem, but they say that they can't find words or something like call it that, call it word. As long as you can call it something, you can talk about it. It's worse when you can't call it anything when they deny anything. So whatever they give you, just go with that. And I find that that helps with resistance. And then too, with the with the patient um, that is in denial, I'll just say, okay, well, why let, why don't we just let's put this out on a radar? And you know, I want you to age gracefully. Let's just follow this every six months. I want you to come back and see me, and we'll we'll follow this. We'll we'll retest you, and just make sure that that everything's going okay. And you can prove me wrong. And typically that works. Um, and with the caregiver, I'll just make sure that they're connected with social work. And that they know they can call us if there's any safety concern. There are times, this is what I have, have um, lived through myself. My father-in-law that lives with me um, is blind and has advanced Alzheimer's. Um, his disease was, uh, was dramat dramatically accelerated by alcohol. He lost his vision in his 30s and alcohol was his, that, that's how he coped. That was his coping mechanism. Um, despite many years of trying to, he was living alone, trying to encourage him to uh, to go to an ALF or to uh, some some a safer care setting. He resisted. He was living alone. We had to just wait until um, until there was uh, there was an emergency, and the emergency was he fell. He was on the floor for 24 hours. He got admitted, and then of course the medical team says you're not safe to go home living alone. So he went to, to rehab. And at that point, it was it, we we learned so much more than what we suspected while he was in rehab. We learned he had we knew why he was drinking spoiled milk. He had no taste buds. We knew why, uh, you know, we we learned, okay, he his his mocha blind was an 11, you know, out of 21. I mean, this is so definitely the what we had suspected in terms of cognitive deficits. No, that was real. And the miracle took place for us because he just said, okay, whatever you guys want. And we looked at each other like, oh, are you, you're, you're kidding? <laughs> um, so we've gone through um, him in, assist, in an assisted living with caregivers uh, to now he's living in our home with 24 seven care. Um, the piece that's challenging for my husband, and, and this is where I've probably learned the most is, you know, he was not a, a loving father to my husband. He was, he was, he was more in competition with my husband than a father. Um, but, and he, he, he never told my, my, my husband that he loved him. Um, and he was extremely, he had a lot of spiritual animosity, anger with God for allowing him to lose his vision. But now every day he tells us that he, he loves us. Um, he wants us to come in and do nighttime prayers with him and uh, we don't never leave the, his little apartment without him saying, God bless you and all of his caregivers. Um, it's been a, re a really dramatic transformation. And, and it's my father, my, my husband has had his father um, kind of return given, returned to him. So it's, it's, it's been beautiful. That's the reframing that I've lived. Um, and what I hope that somehow um, I can help patients and families and experience. Unfortunately, I think we're, yeah. we're out of time. I and mean, we could try to answer this other question. Uh, we'll get back to the people. I'm very sorry, Dr. Van Orden, Dr. Fleming, and, and Deb. Um, there's a question about elder abuse and the high family conflict. If you guys have any questions, about, especially also about your own patients, um, we're happy to answer them um, through the memory care program. Uh, and we'll get back to you guys individually with, but thank you for your attention. Thank you.